Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Outgrow's Marketer of the Month. I'm your host, Dr. Saksham Sharda. I'm the creative director at outgrow.co. And for this month, we are going to interview Drew Neiser, who is the founder and CEO of Renegade, the savvy B2B marketing agency that's been helping CMOs to cut through since 1996. Thanks for joining us, Drew. Uh, Thanks for having me. I love your show. So, Drew, we're going to start with a rapid-fire round just to break the ice. You get three passes. In case you don't want to answer the question, you can just say pass. But try to keep your answers to one word or one sentence only. Okay? You got it. All right. So, the first one. At what age do you want to retire? Never. (laughs) What is something that people often get wrong about you? That I'm really relaxed. How long does it take you to get ready in the mornings? In 16 minutes. Most embarrassing moment of your life? Jumping from a boat to a dock, but I missed the dock and fell in and then had to change (laughs) my clothes that night and left underwear in a bush. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, that was very detailed, I see. (laughs) Fill in the blank. An upcoming marketing trend is blank. An upcoming marketing trend is VCs and PEs discovering that brand matters. <laughs> the city in which the best kiss of your life happened. New York City. Okay. Pick one, Mark Zuckerberg or Jack Dorsey. Jack Dorsey, two jobs, eight hours a day each. Come on, <laughs> give me a break. <laughs> the first movie that comes to your mind when I say the word ambition. Benjamin Franklin documentary. Oh, I haven't seen that, but I'm going to. Okay. When did you last cry and why? I cry all the time. It was, the last time was probably the movie Coda. Ah, I haven't seen it, but it just won the Oscar, right? Brilliant movie and yeah. just really sweet. What advice would you give to your younger self? Uh, don't put all your eggs in one giant client basket. <laughs> The biggest mistake of your career? Probably the same. (laughs) (laughs) Putting all the eggs in the one client basket. 70% of our business was from one client. No matter what I tried to do, it kept happening. How do you relax? Uh, Lots of sports. Play racket sports, mainly. Mm. A habit of yours that you hate? Checking email more than three times a day. The most valuable skill you've learned in life? How to respond to a crisis. Okay. And the last question, your favorite Netflix show. During the pandemic, my wife and I decided we couldn't go anywhere. So we used Netflix as our travel show. So all the international shows, (laughs) we went to Paris with Call My Agent, with Spain, with Money Heist, Israel with Fada, and just, I could keep going. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Fair. Well, that's the end of the rapid fire round. And now we go to the longer questions and I'm interested in how you actually respond to a crisis. Tell us more about that. <laughs> so it, I've had several in, in my career and I think it sort of speaks to a sense of resilience. I'll give you an example. In, in 2020, uh, when the pandemic began, I wasn't sure, gee, what's going to happen to our agency? Uh, we've been through these before. And so my habit now is just assume it's worse for everyone else. And so that's, I, I started reaching out to chief marketing officers at, in March. And by April, we started something called CMO Huddles. And now it's a business that's as big as Renegade. Uh, and sort of this is one of the reasons why I don't need to retire is that I can keep doing this for a long time. Hmm. So your approach to a crisis is to understand that everyone has a crisis and that well, kind of normalizes it in a sense. Yeah. So the, the, the key is just, just to sort of get out of yourself and sort of say, okay, I don't know what's going to happen to us, but I do know that I can help other people. And, and that was sort of when I, when I started reaching out to CMOs and said, how are you doing? And I said, well, my God, we're having to deal with the office shut down. We don't have ability to run our business remotely. We don't know if our customers are going to pay. So we just started troubleshooting all of those issues. And by bringing a group of people together, uh, it, it, we met actually 55 times uh, over a four-month, five-month period. There were so many issues to sort of address and it just reminded me, I mean, similarly, I learned that after 9-11 and learned that after uh, several other things that 
when you start to see and you really things are bad, it's just going to be worse for other people. And and if you focus on helping, you're probably going to come out of it okay. And you won't know where you're going to come out of it, but you'll come out of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how did you like come up with the idea of starting CMO Huddles anyway? Was it from this crisis thing or was there other factors involved in starting something like this? Yeah, there were other factors and, and you're quite perceptive. So uh, a good friend of mine, Pete Kranick, had founded the CMO Club. I, our agency had actually built, uh, done the logo. I'd been part of it for 12 years. Well, on March 2nd, 2020, he sold it to Salesforce. And um, that just felt like to me weird um, for one. And, and two, knowing all the CMOs, I, I thought particularly B2B CMOs could probably use a different kind of help that then mm -hmm. the club was prepared to offer them. And so I just saw a window as well. And even we went into sort of, we'll call it a beta test, although I didn't really know it was a beta test. It was like, I think I can help folks. Let's call it CMO huddles. Let's see where it goes. And about three months into it, uh, the CMOs were saying, Drew, this is a big idea. This is how you should structure it. This is how you, you know, and, and the various services that you should provide. And they really provided the guidance to get, you know, get us so by October 1st, we could launch it as a business in 2020. Okay. And how has Renegade's mission changed over the years since you founded it in 1993? And how does like CMO huddles kind of play into that? Yeah, it's 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 interesting. So we've always had this uh, logo of a saw and our, our mission or purpose, if you will, has always been about cutting through. How you cut through has changed a lot. Uh, we started as a guerrilla marketing agency and helped a lot of giant firms figure out different ways of engaging and creating sort of unique brand experiences. Um, and that was really good until 2008 when the economy crashed and people just stopped spending money on experiential marketing. So we made a major pivot um, and we were doing something called social media before it was called social media. So we said, all right, we're going all in on that. Um, and that was pretty good for a few years and then realized, well, social is really part of content. Content's bigger. Mm -hmm. We want to keep moving towards the front of the brand. And ultimately where we are today is, you know, the real way to cut through is strategically and, and focus on strategy and brand. And so we've moved from this uh, experiential guerrilla firm to a sort of leading edge strategy firm, uh, mm -hmm. kind of with, a, with an evolution of the market, all with the same goal. We're still trying to help marketers cut through, um, but we become a lot more focused in terms of the deliverables. And CMO Huddles fuels Renegade in that, you know, we keep getting smarter about the challenges that CMOs face. Um, having, God, I think we've done over now uh, literally hundreds of huddles um, with hundreds of CMOs, and and that just keeps informing our our practice. So the flexibility, I guess, that Renegade has embraced over the years with its changing nature is something that might also, I guess, at times lead to a crisis if you back the wrong trend at some point and then how do you handle that <laughs> yeah it's true and again this is sort of that moment where i talked about earlier the bill sort of ability to sort of respond to a crisis and and pivot if needed i mean in in 2008 what happened was first of all i started renegade with densu we had a big parent company and we started to get panasonic business that was our main reason for being with densu we grew that business up. It was a huge, we were their second largest vendor. Um, and then it was clear they were going to be leaving over a certain period of time for a number of reasons. And it was 70% of our business. And I couldn't write a business plan based on losing that account. So I went to Dentsu and said, I don't know what's going to happen with Renegade, but I'd rather go it alone. Um, why don't you give me some, you know, let me buy you out, so to speak, um, and let's see what happens. And you know, we really had a very tough time uh, in 2008, but it was, we had to jettison a lot of businesses. And ultimately what saved us was focus at that point is getting rid of some of the businesses and just focusing on social and content. And that led to me starting to interview CMOs. And I've interviewed over 500 now, and that's been a continuous source of learning and knowledge and ability to sort of stay what's on their minds, how to, how to pivot, uh, help, you know, led, led to writing two books. And uh, anyway, all of it comes back to when you get to a crisis, figure out, you know, how you can make a difference, how you can help. 
Hmm. And do you think this pivoting is something that's going to exponentially increase as we enter a much more faster paced marketing sphere in the future? Because like I assume everything is increasing exponentially. So the next thing would be the next leaders would be who can really pivot really fast uh, to trends. Yeah, that I, and I'm of two minds of this because I, I, I honestly, I, I think that, you know, if I were advising an agency right now, I would, you know, where would you want to be? Um, and, you know, you really want to try to find a place where you're the best at, at some kind of vertical and horizontal axis, right? The type of business that you're, you know, the services that you provide in the industries you serve and you find an intersection there where you own it, like you're the best content agency for healthcare, for example. I mean, that's mm -hmm. a positioning and it's likely that's a 10 year, 15 year run. Um, you don't want to get like if you were just a an agency that, for example, did we just do six cents implementations for healthcare? That'd be a problem because that technology could go away. So, you know, you want to give yourself focus, ideally as an agency, vertical and horizontal, but not so narrow that it could be gone in five years. Mm. And could you give us an example of someone who's managed to do that a little according to what you say? You know, it's hard. I mean, I think if you look at healthcare agencies mm -hmm. in general, and I mentioned they've been doing very well, I mean, because that's a segment that just keeps growing and growing. And I now know that there are, I can't name them, but there are healthcare agencies that just do social or healthcare agencies that just do digital. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm less inclined to sort of worry about the services that you provide as opposed to what, for whom you provide them. Because that's where the expertise lies is in the uh, is in the industries. Mm -hmm. So, well, we read your blog series about cats, courageous, artful, thoughtful, scientific framework for you on your website. Would you like yes. to talk more about that? Tell us about cats. Sure. So it, this came out of after I wrote my first book, which was uh, called The CMO's Periodic Table, and it featured sixty four uh, interviews with chief marketing officers. The People start to ask me, Drew, so I can't get to 64. Break it down. What are the traits of the most successful CMOs? And so I started thinking about that and came up with CATS, which is, stands for Courageous, Artful, Thoughtful, and Scientific. And then as I got to my second book, it actually became the framework for the whole book. And it's a framework that I road tested with CMOs for a couple of years. The blog post that you saw was a precursor to the book. Um, and... If you you follow that thing, all if you don't have a great strategy, like if you don't dare to beat a sting, forget about execution. <laughs> so you're only going to be as good as your strategy. And and I'm afraid that it, we did some research, and this is why I wrote the book, is that B2B marketing had gotten ridiculously complicated, but not more effective. And you start to get, boil that down, and you say, well, why isn't it more effective? And you ask CMOs, okay, what uh, is your product or service distinct in the marketplace? And 60% say, yeah. Well, and then we say, is your marketing distinct? 40% said, yeah. And said, wait, that's a huge gap. That's just wrong. It's just <laughs> patently wrong. It is the job of the marketer to dif help differentiate, distinguish, or create a unique brand. So that takes courage. And a lot of, and that's it, when you have the courage to say, no, we can't say that and that and that. When you have the courage to say, we're going to be a color that isn't every other everybody else's color when you have the courage to say we're going to talk differently internally and externally we're going to be different ideally we're going to be unique that takes courage and not every you know marketer has the courage to butt against sometimes the ceo sometimes the board of directors sometimes others who are just saying demand 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 just just buy another google ad so that's courage that we can get to artful i'm, I'm happy to keep going or pause yes you... please do okay so <laughs> Great. You, you, so you have the courage to, get, to create this unique positioning, right? Now you've got to artfully, and the, the, one of the interesting things about being a chief marketing officer is you can't do it alone. I mean, you can't even try to do it alone. You could come up day one, walk in there with a brilliant idea, and it won't happen because you have to build this sort of uh, collective understanding of the company. And so the first thing I recommend to CMOs to do, and I have it in the book, is do a Employee survey, it's so easy, it's so basic. And just sort of ask them, are they proud of working at the company? Would they recommend the company? And ask them for four words to describe the brand. And you just, it's amazing what they deliver 
And then you can say, hey, thank you for your input, wherever you end up with your unique strategy. So artfulness is not just a creative ability to think about design and words. Those are important. It's also an artfulness in being able to bring the organization together around a common purpose. And, and that's, again, takes the courage to have an interesting, distinctive one, and then it takes artfulness to rally everybody around it. And that's good. Those two things are really good building blocks. Agencies love those two because agencies deliver courage and artfulness in their sleep. The next part I think it makes it kind of interesting is thoughtfulness in that we live in this give to get economy where if you do stuff, if you deliver value in every single thing, if marketing is an exchange of value, then chances are you're really going to be helpful and considered. Uh, and this is more important than ever now that you know people are doing their own journeys. They're buying without any interaction with a salesperson, even in B2B. And so thoughtfulness is key. And I mean, but what I mean by that is, what could you do for a prospect or a customer or an employee that will help them in their life, whether it's their work life or their home life? Okay, all of those things are good, really good, and can go really far, but you still lose if you don't have the scientific method, if you don't have some metrics to back you up. And so in the last three chapters of the book, I talk about this uh, measure what matters, because most of them have too many metrics, but they don't have employee, customer, prospect, and brand metrics. Um, automate attentively. Basically, in B2B, the tech stacks are taking up 20 25% of budget. That's a joke to me. Get it down to 10 And then lastly, the best part of our business is an opportunity to experiment. So we talk about testing to triumph. And I love that. And that's where if you can build a culture of, of experimentation as a chief marketing officer, you could become the CEO of the company. And, and what, where did you get the ideas for all of this from? So what were the inspirational source material for writing about cats? So almost all of it are the interviews that I've been doing. And I mentioned mm -hmm. in 2008 when we made that pivot, and I said, okay, we're going to be experts in social and content. And to do that, we're going to be practitioners. And I started, I said, I'm going to write an article every week. Well, you can't write an article every week unless you have a source material for that. So I start, because I'm just not that creative. So I started interviewing CMOs and I'm now well over 500. So every, and I look at every interview that I do as a case history. And so um, I don't always know, didn't know that when I was doing an interview, uh, you know, three years ago with Jeff Perkins about what he was doing at uh, Park Mobile, that that was going to become part of the book uh, under the, uh, you know, experimentation and building a culture of experimentation. But uh, it was great that it that I had done that interview because I was doing all the homework. I just wasn't sure where uh, where it was going to apply. And what is the count with uh, the one article per week? Is it still one article per week or have you increased or how do you get yourself to write in the first place? Okay, so um, <laughs> first I committed to it and then uh, did it. And, you know, it used to take me four hours and that was all I would give myself to write a thousand word article. That was what I gave myself to do. Um now I and then I did that for one year for sure, 52 articles that the first year. Now it's uh, probably fewer, like because my podcast um, sort of produces articles really easily. Uh, because we take the podcast, we shorten it down to a Q and A. It, it the, a shorter version of it goes into Ad Age, and we're doing two of those. I mean, I, maybe I'm doing one or two a month now. Uh, for a while, it was it was yeah. You know, I've got a podcast, I've got a live streaming show, we've got Renegade and we've got CMO huddles. Something has to give. <laughs> okay. So how do you determine how valuable the content or any content is to the client's time? When do you know it's good enough, for example? You know, I love that question. And, and I'm going to turn it around because there's no shortage of content, right? We There's so much content out there. And so to me, what's happened in, you hear this expression, digital fatigue, in, in, that it sort of creeped in and people started calling it Zoom fatigue. And then they realized, no, this is bigger. We're just tired of being online. So the bar for quality content went up. And so the way I look at it, every piece of content that I produce or we produce is meant for a very singular audience of chief marketing officers. Will they get value out of it? And if they won't get value out of it, if, if I don't think they will, then 
we won't run it. And similarly for anybody creating content, if you know your target audience, but I always say like, would you send this to your CEO? Would you have them read this? Because if they would find value out of it, then chances are the rest of your target will. So you just have to raise the bar, uh, I think now, because there is so much content. And I look at our shows and constantly questioning, and this is why you have to do homework before you do the interview. And I don't, everybody I talk to, I don't do a podcast with, because I don't think there's a story that's going to be distinctive enough or that I'll be able to suck out and say, okay, here's three things that I learned from this from this uh, episode. Hmm. And how do you think, like, uh, could you tell us more about, talk about customers, if at all, do they have a role in marketing? <laughs> oh my God, yes, of course they do. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, it, they are everything. And, and you know, there's, there's no doubt there's a partnership. I mean, the, the best work that, that we've done over the years, for the most part, I would say nine out of 10 times is with the best clients, the ones who sort of understood their role, your role, but could push you to say, well, that's pretty good, but can you do better? And, you know, I like this, but I don't like this. And have you talked to, you know, show this to a, another one of our customers and get some input on it. So I have totally welcome and, and, you know, if a long career in marketing, it's like, there, you know, as the old saying goes, clients get the, the work that they deserve. Um, and I, we've worked with some just amazing clients who really do push us, push us in the right way. And what's some of the best business advice you have ever gotten from a client or from someone? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> You know, and part of it is is something that I probably not always listen. But you know, anytime anybody said focus, um, I would pause. And this is just part of me being kind of interested in lots of things and being a little ADD, as I often forget to focus. So uh, I, I, that's probably always been the best advice anybody's ever said. You know, you're doing too much. As an agency, you might be doing too much, or individually, you might be trying to do too much. So uh, focus is your friend. And what I guess this is something that has come up in our podcast quite a lot, uh, that a little bit of attention deficiency kind of helps in <laughs> this world is this internet of clickbaiting and everything. What do you think about that? Uh, is it, I know you Jackson? said it's a liability, but do you also think it's uh, the opposite of a liability sometimes? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'm with, so Peter Shankman has done a whole thing on this and how ADHD really made a huge difference in his life and how he was able to, uh, and, and I think I've, I actually interviewed him and I saw what his, his situation, it's far worse than mine. Um, the answer is yes, in, in that uh, when I do actually focus on something, I get lost and I have to apologize for being late to meetings all the time because that happens to me. But I am only apologizing slightly because when I get in a zone, I'm in it and I'm accomplishing something and feeling really good about it. So if I'm 10 minutes late to uh, now, hopefully it's not for a podcast interview where a CMO is waiting for me, but you know, so there, there is the good side of it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the bad side of it is that you're checking your email too many times. The bad side of it is it look squirrel, you, you know, you get distracted. And, mm -hmm. and again, if the opposite of focus is distraction, that's the battle that, uh, that I think we all face to one degree or another. So speaking of really getting into something and enjoying it, tell us the biggest, the question is business accomplishment, but I'm just going to say biggest accomplishment this year. It doesn't have to be business related. It could be a meeting you went into and you really liked it. I don't know. Uh, business, <laughs> biggest accomplishment. Well, um, probably, you know, we just surpassed a hundred subscribers at uh, CMO Huddles, um, which was a milestone uh, of ours and, and an exciting moment um, that sort of, both was kind of proof of concept and proof that we had something really exciting going here. Um, so that, yeah, that I, I would say that was probably uh, the bell ringer so far this year. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, congratulations. And uh, we saw your mascot, Louie, on Renegade's <laughs> leadership team. Clearly, he's doing a great job. What would you like to say to your canine readership? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yes, it's funny. He's, he's right here, uh, right now, sleeping just beside me, coaching me along the way. Uh, the You know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, but, uh, you know, be good and, and, and uh, seek out those treats.
<laughs> so what's with cats and dogs? <laughs> <laughs> you know, look, I'm an animal lover. It's it's uh, what can I tell you? Uh, okay. You know, but what's funny about it is, well, we all we love our animals, right? And there's a certain way of if if you can get people to see things in in things that they like and appreciate it's just that much more memorable right and and then so the the cats thing is it's like what wait what it's a little <laughs> bit why are you talking about marketing theory and cats and to me that's sort of part of the story yeah i think product hunts entire marketing is around cats like if you go to their website it's like cats everywhere uh but so rarely the question then is drew are you a cat person or a dog person uh, you know i uh, <laughs> I'm both. It's it. I think I don't think. See why you need to have a choice. We had both for years. We should have put that in the rapid fire round and made you pick one, and then there'd be like a <laughs> PR disaster somewhere. Okay. Uh, are there any mistakes you've made that you don't want any other marketers to make? Oh God, I've made so many mistakes. I, I, you know, I'm really tired of making mistakes. Um, uh, uh, yeah. Let's see. We. Uh, we fired two multinational clients within a three-month period. I think probably we should have only fired one of them or spaced it out a little bit. That would be one. We were just a little too quick to say, yeah, I don't think there's a culture match here. Um, and uh, uh, again, I think there probably were times where uh, we may be underinvested in certain opportunities as they were as they were coming up. Um, and yeah, and you know, I, I would say that a mistake if you really want to grow your company fast, sometimes I think uh, I probably wasn't as tough as I I could have should have been. Um, mm -hmm. and uh, and that again, it, it depends on where you want to end up. And so when you fired the two clients, I guess there was a crisis situation, but you know how to deal with those after well, having... Well, you know, look, I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> you know, you're only as good as your clients. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you have clients that are really wearing your team down and you're not making any money on them, no matter how good the brand name or frankly, how good the work that you are doing for them is, you're going to either, something's going to break. Right, because why are you doing work for a client that you're not making any money on? And and two, why are your employees miserable working on that client? You either have to fix the relationship and and confront the client on it, or, or you do have to walk away. Um, and it's just painful when you do it because you, you you should have a plan B, right? Well, okay, well it may, maybe you do it when you win another client, right? You just plan it out. Don't just get rid of it when. It's like, oh, you know, you, you've got the 10th complaint about how the client treated uh, one employer or another. Mm. Actually, I was actually listening to one of your podcasts in which you were talking about, or I, I think your guest was talking about how small and be medium businesses have an advantage that they can have 24-7 customer support uh, as compared to enterprises who would really get drowned if they offered 24-7 customer support. So how do you think small and medium businesses should go about interacting with clients? Like what should be the something and advice about well it. so I, it's so interesting because i'm listening to what's the book uh it's called free time and i am fascinated by this notion that a small business particularly one where you you own the company yourself that you can set up a company that uh works for you and in in other words and you could say we don't do customer service on the weekends, right? You could do that as a small business and we say, but here's how we, we have an online something or other to do it. So I feel like small business gives you an advantage in a lot of ways in that you can define the parameters, whereas a large business and a medium-sized business, the marketplace kind of def defines it, right? And you can make that part of your personality. It's just harder with bigger businesses because if everybody has 24 seven customer support and you don't, um, that that's a problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, imagine an airline that didn't have 24 seven <laughs> customer support. <laughs> yeah, that would be bad, right? So uh, anyway, I, I, I think the interesting part of being an entrepreneur right now is not necessarily saying, uh, gee, I wanna get from five people to a thousand people, but how do I create a five, 10 person company that Every employee is getting it's really feeling good about their contribution. And maybe they're only working four days a week. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, the last question is, what would you be doing if not this? <laughs> um, well, my third book is going to is going to be on Benjamin Franklin, uh, but it, it, from a very funky angle. And I would love to be talking to seventh graders about this remarkable human being, both strengths and weaknesses, because he was really a true human being. I mean, he had lots of flaws, but and sort of get them excited about the possibility of what one individual could accomplish in their lifetime. And that would probably be me. So you're writing the next Hamilton. <laughs> well, kind of, but, but, but also more importantly than writing it is just that gives me permission to mm -hmm. go to classrooms and talk about this individual in a way that, frankly, I don't even think the documentary that I'm that I'm watching on on Burns really gets at what, which is, because he was a comp, he accomplished so much, but um, the inspiration that is there to be found in his story is, um, I think, might. Be a little lost right now in in that documentary and and i think we need inspiration uh right now <laughs> and earlier you said you you were listening to a book about something so you're listening to books so you're doing audiobooks oh, a lot i do i listen them. i listen to a lot of books <laughs> yeah and right now okay. i and it could be an age thing but i'm obsessed with well part of it's not this that for one of the things I know about CMOs is that they're all time constrained. Most of us are time constrained. So I'm really been focused lately on how do we be more effective without spending more time, right? Sort of changing this formula. So I've this is the third book that I've listened to in the last month on just on time management, energy management, and and finding ways of getting things done without putting in 90 hours a week. And and where do you go on a hunt for these books? Um, so they usually come recommended, or it sort mm -hmm. of becomes a series. Like I'll, I'll I'll be listening to one, and they'll recommend another, or I'll talk to someone about it. And so you know, I was talking to someone at Franklin Covey, for example. They're an expert in this area, and they recommended a book uh, that I so you know that's the book I listened to, and then discovered this other one because Dory Clark mentioned it. Mm -hmm. And the last, last question is, uh, <laughs> you said you're going to have a 10-minute coffee break after this. So do you actually just drink coffee for 10 minutes doing absolutely nothing? Uh, is so, that like a meditative thing? <laughs> no, 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 no. So <laughs> Renegade, and we, we went virtual per, pretty much right away and is, have no plans to go back to physical offices. But one of the ways that we stay together is that, and we used to do this twice a week, but now we, we do it once a week, is we have a coffee break. Um, and we just you know, we chat. It's it's water cooler conversation. We get our beverage of choice and uh, hang out and find out. And because <laughs> our folks are spread out now, not just around the city, but outside the country, um, it's kind of fun. Oh, what's happening in Ireland? What's happening in Copenhagen? <laughs> and and so we sort of get today in in international news plus, uh, you know, just hearing what's happening in people's lives. Okay, well, thanks everyone for joining us for this month's episode of Outcrow's Market of the Month. That was Drew Nicer, who is the founder and CEO of Renegade, the savvy B2B marketing agency that's helping CMOs cut through since 1996. Thanks for joining us, Drew. Hey, my pleasure. Thanks for doing this show. It's great. Check out the website for more details and we'll see you once again next month with another Marketer of the Month.